Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, uh, hi everyone. Uh, I am joined again with uh, Dimitri. Um, uh, and uh, so a few things have changed since we last met. YouTube channel is up to what? Yeah, it's 10,400 10, subscribers. <laughs> That's pretty good from, uh, I think you had 8,000 last time we spoke. Yeah. Uh, and uh, lots of things have changed. So let's, let's get right into it. Um, and I guess you could share your views from you being a quant. So you, you're in the field, but you've got quite a bit of following. So you, I'm sure you're getting feedback as to what's going on. And I understand lots of students also get in touch with you. Uh, as to Dimitri, what should I do next? Um, <laughs> and then uh, from my point of view, uh, since I manage a, a financial engineering program, I could also share what we're seeing uh, in terms of, uh, you know, who's joining, uh, what are they going doing right now uh, with the online uh, teaching? And then, you know, what's going to happen next for all these students? So I guess Maybe you, you could tell me a little bit about what you hear from students that are thinking about applying in this environment. What, what's, what is it that uh, they're thinking about? Okay, so the biggest, I guess the biggest concern is that students have applied, of course applications were due a while ago. Um, or there might still be a few out, but I don't think so. And they have this acceptance letter and now they're coming to me saying, I'm required to do the program online. And then many programs are saying you're accepted only for this year. So if you turn us down and don't want to do the online, you're going to have to reapply next year. So the question is, is should I do the online degree? Our company's going to hire me or should I wait a year and see how things kind of shake out? I think that's the big question in a lot of students minds coming into this kind of pandemic environment with the fall school year starting soon. Yeah, what I'm seeing is a lot of hesitation. Uh, I mean, a lot of the programs have waived uh, the GMAT or the GRE and some of the, and they're not really guaranteeing, um, they can't guarantee anything in terms of where they're gonna be taught. Right. Um, so it, it is a, a dilemma for the students because they, um, they, 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 they could wait, but can they wait? Yeah, and I, I think that's the big kicker I'm trying to emphasize with a lot of the students is they keep saying, should I wait a year? And then I always ask the next question, which is what are you gonna do for a year? Are you working? Or are you just an undergrad student who's just gonna take a year off? I mean, I think there's a lot of opportunity cost really weigh in that situation. And I think for most of them, it's like you're coming right out of undergrad. You want to go right into graduate school, right? Taking a year off to work at, I don't know, a minimum wage paying job or something not relevant for a year. It's kind of like putting your life on hold. So my advice to a lot of these students is if you're going to, if you have nothing else going on, just do the online degree. Because I think a lot of the programs in general are expecting that you'll do a semester, maybe a year online. And then I could see a lot of them saying, okay, you're going to bring all these students onto campus for, you know, the next school year and you just finish up as a regular program. So I think it's smart just to keep going with it. But I mean, on the same token, if you have like an amazing job and you're making good money and there's no hurry to go to school, you'd be a rare case. <laughs> I definitely was never in that position. So I think in general, I think it's a big mistake to put on hold the career itself, hoping that one day things will get better. Because you're assuming obviously that things are going to get better and things are going to be different, or at least they're going to go back to normal. Uh, so there's two things here. The first thing is, yeah, you have those students that are unsure. I will tell you that I'm seeing a uh, lots of students that actually had a job and they don't have a job anymore, or they are undergraduates and they were promised a job and the offer got rescinded. So where a lot of them told me originally, well, you know, I have a job. Do I really need to spend another year or two? Yeah, it would be great if I had it, but I have a job. So those same students <coughs> are coming back and then saying, you know, can I still apply? Because 
I don't have any, and, and, and to your point, I don't have anything going anywhere. Right. So, so you got a two, two type of students that if you're able to wait for one year, great, see what happens and get the education that you thought you were going to get. Of course, you have to assume that when you come back, that guess what, we're still online. So then yeah. you, <laughs> it's a yeah. big bet. Or, and then you have the students that basically are saying, uh, I had a job, I don't have a job anymore. And in fact, uh, I have a couple of cases where the company that they're working for, so you got the one that didn't get the job, fine. But then there are some that are working and they're being told, now would be a good time maybe to spend a year off and studying. Yeah. And I, I think it's really an optimal situation for a lot of students in the fact that going to school during a recession is great because the markets aren't really moving. Companies aren't promoting. There's a lot of layoffs. There's uncertainty. If you don't have to fight that corporate tidal wave of layoffs and everything, and you've got a spot in an academic program, like don't worry about the rest of it. Just dive into these academic institutions and really like focus on the the education itself and not worry about the other components, I think. I mean, historically, you know, programs do better during recessionary time because what you just said, you, you just said, the only difference this time is, you know, I think in 2008, we had about 6 million unemployed. We're up to 23 or 20, some ridiculous number. Right. Um, so you got to really think that this is going to be kind of, uh, you know, life changing or, or, or um, so um, what I have is um, so, so that's, so that these are the students that we're looking at basically the one that maybe they should wait. Maybe they don't have a choice and maybe they're working and they're being told, maybe you should go back to school for a while. Okay. Yeah. So we don't lose you and you know, you don't waste so much time because frankly, we don't have much for you to do anyway. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, so it depends who's listening and where you fall into. But uh, I guess the advice is uh, staying and doing nothing is probably not a good choice for any of those students because you're going to tell them why. No, you know what? I, I want to keep working. I don't want to go to school. They say, well, you know what? They don't have a job for you. Uh, yeah. You didn't have your undergraduate and. Uh, you are doing nothing now. You're going to wait a year doing nothing and for waiting for a job to call you back at some point in the future. So, yeah, I guess the thing is, uh, you know, do, do something. Okay. Yeah. So and I, and I guess yeah, the, the, the big, uh, I guess, argument that they might put out there is maybe I go to school, I rack up the debt, and then I graduate unemployed. <laughs> That, that's, a, that's a risk you got to take. I mean, there's no way around it. But I think in general, life is so short and your career is so short from a very big perspective here. Like, are you really willing to throw out one year just waiting for things to get better? It's a challenging question. It's not as black and white, but I think it's worth it as long as you're willing to put the work in. Because companies are going to rehire when it rebounds. People need other people to work. It can't last forever. But at least you've already invested in that downtime, I guess, is the, the big pro for it. Correct. Um, so the second, uh, I guess, second point we could, we could address a little bit is the student profile, right? I mean, that's the student um, demeanor. But, but the profile, I think, is changing as well because, um, you know, the airports are closed. The embassies are closed. So on, on top of those three items that they have to wrestle with, mm -hmm. then there's also those students that are not in this country that are, uh, you know, in, 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 a, in another country. And they kind of have to wrestle on top of that as to whether or not I should be coming or not. What do you hear on your side? I mean, I, I think most students are getting those online offers meaning they'll stay at home in their home countries. They'll continue to learn from abroad. I think that's a really safe bet because the worst scenario would be you spend a bunch of money, you finally get everything situated, all your paperwork, you get to the US, and then all of a sudden the campus tells you like it's shut down and you're stuck living somewhere where you don't know anybody. 
it's all just so new to you. And then you also, like, I don't know if the paperwork's going to hold up. If you're in the United States, but you're not technically an on-campus student, you're only online, it just seems like a safe bet for a lot of these students to stay at home if it's an option and then do the online approach. Yeah. Um, a lot of them are telling me, um, yes, I'm interested, but, you know, is my embassy might not be open uh, or my connection is not the greatest either. Okay. Uh, but, but yet I need to, I, I need to do something. So, and I think we're seeing lots of interest, but the decision is, is somehow, po- I, I guess they're thinking about all these, they're, they're wrestling with all these issues. Um, yeah. um, and then on top of that, um, I, I guess the, the bigger topic is then, are you getting this, because some of the students from my program, for example, are already online, right? Mm-hmm. What are you hearing in terms of the students that are in the programs right now, in the uh, financial engineering or quant programs, what are they telling you about their experience with um, online currently? So a lot of those students, for some reason, don't reach out to me. <laughs> um, <laughs> but I do hear a lot of students contemplating making that decision of, should you go the online route? Because it does seem more common now, someone's already working. For example, say I'm working in, I don't know, Salt Lake City or something, and John Hopkins has a great online program, or you know, Lehigh has a program online, I want to do that. And they're trying to weigh those options of, is the online worth it? And I think the biggest concern from students isn't the education. I think it's actually the perception from the employer. You know, I had, that's what I, 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 I mean, I, I didn't know what to think so much about because I always thought I was, you know, I had discussion with lots of people and they told me that, well, you know what, this type of program cannot be taught online. Okay. Uh, but that's, that's just somebody's perception. And right. because, you know, you need the interaction with the professor, you need interaction with the students, you need to be on campus, you need to talk, you need to exchange ideas. I, I get that, but that's not just for this program. It could be for, frankly, any, any program. So what I did is I conducted an informal survey, right? So I went out to my student, I said, listen, what is, what, di- what did you think, first of all, about this semester? What was your perception? And I will say that about a third of the student basically tell, told me this sucks, right? Okay. Because uh, A, uh, I don't have access to my professor. B, this is not what I sign up for. But having said that, two thirds of them said, you know what? It, it's not that, I mean, yes, you, you, don't, you don't have this interaction. Okay, fine. Uh, you're not on campus, fine but it is so much more flexible and e- because some of the courses are recorded. So if you don't get it, you listen to it again. And it's not like you don't have access to the professor. You could always zoom. You know, that's what I do. I mean, anytime they want. So, so you, it's not going to replace, it's not the same thing. Mm-hmm. Right. But it is this, they, some of, I, I was kind of surprised actually the two thirds of them told me that yes, um, I'm losing something, but I'm getting something else. And that something right. else I'm getting uh, can be quite useful, especially if I don't get what's going on. Um, and yeah, I don't, have in, I, I don't have interaction with the other student as much as I used to or with the professor, but I do have A, the flexibility, two, I could listen to the recording, um, I have more time, uh, I, could, I could structure my time much better mm-hmm. if I'm doing other things I could put you know it so 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 I'll give you a perspective breakdown on because I've been thinking about this a lot the online piece is really something that's it's popular um, it's definitely kind of like working from home now for professionals like it's coming but when is it coming and how are people going to implement it is going to be a struggle and I think like you mentioned right the pro of it is you can repeat it So like if the professor said something and I don't know, I'm checking my phone or something and I missed that statement, I can easily rewind and I can rewatch and you can get a really good understanding. Uh, 
one of the big concerns for me is I see a lot of people in the industry that come out of school and they come into the industry and they've memorized so much stuff, which is great. But when you have to apply <laughs> these concepts to a new idea, it's hard to stretch outside the box. And so one of the concerns from an online perspective is when you're on campus, right? Like you mentioned, there's all these students around you and everybody's together and they're doing homework. There's like an environmental factor where you focus that 40, 50, 60 hours a week on homework, class and school. And of course, I mean, you're going out with friends and you might go to the bar or do something else. But at the same time, having that campus feel and having like one purpose in life a lot of the students that usually reach me for online state that, you know, like I've got a job, I've got a family, I'm in another country, I've got all this stuff going on. And I just want to tack on this online degree. And then I want to go out and get this amazing job. And like my life will be changed overnight. And I think they miss that point that if you're working, I mean, I understand you have family and you have a job and all this, it's really hard to take your brain out of your daily life because paying bills is so much more important than actually like focusing on classes. And so I think if a program can figure out how to select students that are more focused on these programs, as well as making sure, like you're doing, right, being accessible to the students, having access will make the online experience worth it. But I just don't see right now right, a lot of universities going the online route. There's only a few here and there. But it'd be nice to see programs going out there, addressing that, and then trying to reach out to the industry and saying, hey, I understand the concerns completely. Let me like send over some resumes and try out three or four of these students. And I think if you can get over that, that hurdle, I think that a lot of people will be on board with online could be a nice viable option for it. Yeah. I mean, you brought, that's a very interesting point because when we mean online, uh, let this, I guess you have what we call in in, in other words, you know, this thing gets recorded ahead of time or uh, which is a case uh, in our university, we also have, uh, live session, so you know you're, you're live with, with the uh, with the faculty, but but you're right. I mean, you, it's not just okay. This is it. Either you like it, or you don't like it. No, it's this is it. But we need to make some change. We need to start understanding the 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 you know the, the concept behind online, and which is even if you're live or if you're asynchronous, you need to be able to start to you know, you know, eat up a little bit of what makes the on-campus experience interesting, mm -hmm. i.e., uh, you know, reach out to the students a lot more, allow them to get in touch with you a lot more, which is to be a lot easier, quite frankly, as opposed yeah. to having to go to campus and, you know, make an appointment. You could, you know, you could reach anyone in their house, in their home, anytime they want. And they, 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 yeah. That's what okay with that, <laughs> which is always, always an issue. But, but, but literally, people are available all the time then. Uh, and then amongst the students, well, they have to learn that, uh, you know, you get into a Zoom session, you create your own little, you know, team, and you could just as well communicate. Yeah, you can't go to, the, to on, you can't be on campus, but then you have, may have no choice, right? You, you, you have to start, this, the, these universities uh, that have been doing it for years now, uh, and yeah. they have perfected what works and what doesn't work, uh, you know, a little bit of interaction, a little bit of, um, uh, you know, interaction with students, professors, a little bit of, you know, make it more interesting. So it's not just boring. So uh, it, it's a different skill, right? Right. It, I think part of the, I guess the scare too, we see a lot with the online movement is that I feel like the institution responsible for accreditations of universities as a whole. So for campus, online, everything, they've done a terrible job in the last 10 years where I feel like there's so many programs coming up and perhaps you're some big name university, I don't know, maybe you're an Ivy League or something, they can throw the world's worst program out there and charge students a lot of money for it. And yet the accreditation, I don't think takes the time to look through to see, is this really a good program? Are they really putting their heart and soul into it? Or is it more or less like you have a lazy school who's just making up degrees? And I think that's one of the pieces people don't get. Like you go to school because you want to learn, you get educated, which is part of it. But for an employer perspective, these academic institutions provide like the easy, an easier filter of quality students versus non-quality students. So the student that's going to, for example, like, I don't know, MIT or Yale or Princeton or something, right? They have really good GPAs. And then these schools go and they interview these students and they kind of pre-filter students out for you. So you end up with the cream of the crop. 
But the real question is, is academically, are they the same program? Possibly. The guy from Harvard, the guy from Yale might be the same as, you know, a guy from the community college down the street from you. But again, how do you filter and how is their accreditation and how do you kind of factor in the quality part, which I think is the hardest thing for universities to do because small programs might have like a all-star or five-star program. It's amazing. And yet it's really hard for you as a program, right, to go and say, hey, you know, big company A, B, and C, check out this amazing degree I've got because there's a risk associated there with hiring students and the cost of hiring and then all those hurdles that <laughs> lay on the employment side as well. So you mentioned hiring and cost. Let's talk a little bit about what's going on in, in, in this market. Is this, so is this a buyer's market for the students or is it a seller's market for the, uh, the university? Um, I, that's a tough one. <laughs> I, I think realistically it's a buyer's market for the universities in the sense that I do think there'll be more applications, more students that are kind of in a tough spot. Perhaps they realize their career is a dead end. They want to change and do something different, right? They need either a four-year degree or a graduate degree of some sorts. I definitely think the universities will have a wider range of applicants. And at the same time, I'm also concerned from an employer perspective that universities will then just increase their numbers instead of keeping class sizes competitive. <laughs> yes. Uh, I mean, you know, supply and demand. I mean, the, I mean the, the supply of students have gone down. I mean, if you think about just the foreign students alone, even if they wanted to, even if they did everything that we want them to do, they just can't come in. It's just not possible. Right. right. So, so you lost, you lost a bunch of students there. So, I, so de facto, you know, if you want to attract more students, you're going to need to entice them to join. Right. Uh, and I'm seeing, you know, a game being played at the scholarship level, right, where students are being offered, uh, you know amounts, certain amounts, you know, more than usual by universities wanting to capture that market. Uh, so, you know, so on one end, you don't need to take a GMAT, you don't need to take a GRE. They want you, they're enticing you. So it feels to me like it's more of a buyer's market where the students now feel, hey, you know, it's a risky proposition, obviously, because you don't know uh, you know, if they're going to want you, and I mean, you, you might play that game a little bit and say, well, this university is offering me twenty twenty five thousand dollars $25,000. Yeah. Maybe I'll go with that university. Well, are you comparing apples and apples again? Right. Do, have you seen this as a newer trend or have you seen this over the last few years? I, I, I think it's a newer trend. Okay. Yeah. I'm seeing, uh, I mean, usually scholarships would have been reserved for students that you want to attract because they have, you know, you want them. Yeah, they're better, better qualified. I mean, we have, you know, 3.8, 3.9, and these students, yeah, we want them to, to join our program. And some of them get a free ride, literally. But um, when you go to the, you know, the, the students that have the, 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 the decent, decent GPA, oops. Uh, well, actually, um, this other university is offering me a, a huge scholarship. Huh. This is actually backwards from what I would expect. I would expect there'd be so many students, people that, right, they have free time, they've graduated, they need something to do, people coming back from careers. But it's interesting that you guys are seeing actually less. I mean, uh, we're competing. There's, there's, there's competition going on at a at, at different level. Now, obviously, uh, that's a game that is, it's a very, you know, you have to be careful, you know, our students play this game because um, you know, you do say, you know what, go ahead. I mean, we're not gonna, you know, and, uh, then they end up with, yeah, you save some money, but did you really save money? Right. Because, you know, $10,000 is, is nothing when you could be offered a $120,000 job versus a hundred or versus $80,000 job. You just right. lost that money in one. So it's uh and usually it, it it doesn't i mean i haven't i haven't 
analyze the, the, the situation fully, but it hasn't been really with some of the better universities, quite frankly, or the better program, right? Okay. So um, uh, obviously they, they will tend to hurt more. So they'll tend to be more, quote unquote, desperate to, to try to get in there and, and try to entice the student. And I tell the student, I say, well, listen, uh, you know, you, you, you know what it is and you, you have to decide on your own. If you had the money before, uh, if you don't have the money, you don't have the money. But if you had the money, does this really make a huge amount of difference? It's, 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 it's a tough choice um, because then later on, you, first of all, the offer might not be, uh, you may not make the offer anyway. You may lose the opportunity. And on top of that, you may not get the program that you thought you were going to get. And then, you know, you save some money, but frankly, um, yeah, long runs, it's not going to pay out. It's not, it should be the cherry on top. You want yeah. the program and they're offering you great. Thank you. Yeah. But if you're going to play the, uh, cause this is not a commodity, right? Like we said in our previous podcast, there are so many items, you know, the curriculum is one thing, the, the, the alumni network is another. And the projects are going off. For example, what we're doing a lot of right now, I'm reaching out to lots of uh, startups uh, because I realize that they have a lot beyond the curriculum, right? They have a lot of things that they could offer to the students beyond the classroom, right? Makes so sense. Maybe others you know, don't do that. They have a great curriculum and, and they think it's fantastic. And, and it's a lot of work because, you know, you need to um, yeah. you know, get in touch with the startups. You got to prepare programs and, and, and beyond just the capstone. Because I realized that, that's maybe we should talk about in another podcast, I realized that there's a lot of learning that goes on into these projects that you don't get to, because you can't teach everything in, uh, in, in the curriculum. So, um, so there's a lot of stuff going on. So this is not apple and apples. You got to really, really make sure you know what you're picking and what you're selecting and what your prospects are and where it's located and, I mean, you're going to spend money anyway, so. Yeah. The, uh, the, the reason I ask about how long the trend's been going is because the MBA programs have been slowly sweeping under the rug here. The, their application numbers have been falling for like the last three to five years. And so I, I, that one seems to be more of a market-driven paradigm here, right? You charge like hundred plus thousand dollars for a degree. I mean, most jobs you can do with an MBA, you could do with an undergrad. And then you start looking at now like financial engineering's come in, it's more quantitative, it's more analytical. You're very specialized for specific roles. And so now it's like you're moving slowly the business people out of these realms. So now is the, is that, I mean, a lot of these financial engineering degrees are $70,000 and students complain. And I'm like, I got a friend over here who's paying 120,000 for an MBA and yet you're still unemployed at the end of it. And I'm like, this guy specialized though. There's a job for a lot of you where I think a lot of those business roles and more generalist kind of perspectives are kind of dying out as we're seeing more of these specialized degrees kind of rise up. So speaking of dying out, so what's, what is next here? Do we go back? Is this just a long period we wait and then we go back to where we were or something is changing? I, I don't think you can go back. I think this is, this is the new paradigm is, even for example, like, so working from home is the industry equivalent to essentially having class online because you're working online. And I see now that it's like Pandora's box is opened. There's no way for companies to pack all of that back in and force people to do the old paradigm. And so I think real estate, this is the trial period. Like the universities that have online programs now, this is where the rubber's going to hit the road on is, is it working? Did you do a good job with the students? Are you building a reputation now that this was the online program that we really liked? Or is there gonna definitely be kinks and things to work out and to improve if you're out of fine tune it? But I, I think this is somewhat of a turning point for the academic community as well, that it's gonna go more online. There's gonna be more opportunities to kind of reach different students that might not have the ability to get to your country, for example. So it becomes more of a global education system but I definitely see it going more towards an online kind of I think, paradigm I now. think this is going to sharpen everybody's pencils. You're going to have to, because, you know, look for what happened with, uh, forget, forget the academia for a second. Look at the retail sector, right? You have companies. This, if, if they had, I mean, you could say, I'm not, not going to name names, but these some of those big retailers, you know, they were kind of fledging 
this just killed them, right? Yeah. They were, you know, there's lots of industries that were kind of on borderline and they were kind of trying to compete and they were trying to get the funding and they were being kept alive. And this just, you know, a lot of them filed for bankruptcy. So um, uh, that did it. Um, and I think with the education system, uh, well, you know, you need to up your game now. You need to realize that uh, uh, it's going to, you need to be virtual, right? I heard lots of, um, I heard lots of companies that are going to be, um, they're going to be uh, doing lots of uh, online uh, interaction. Uh, in fact, uh, some of the companies are going to um, um, give away their, uh, their office space, right? Um, yeah. So there's a trend going on. They're not renewing their space. It's not that we're going to get back to the office soon. Right. Um, and, and my first takeaway too is I thought there's no way senior management and all these banks and institutions and trading firms and like retail and everything, there's no way they'll allow people to work from home. And yet now I'm starting to talk to other friends at other companies and a lot of senior management's coming out saying, my employees are more productive now. We're getting more work done. And so I think senior management is starting to take a step back and realize maybe working from home is actually a better option, right? For cost, as you mentioned, and also productivity is increasing. It's kind of hard to make an argument that we should all rush back to the office format when we're seeing a lot better improvements out of that working from home or online approach. I mean, all the companies I'm talking to and I'm saying, you know, <laughs> Hey, where are you located? This is one of those blockchain companies. And she said, this is, well, I'm in Maine today, but it's like, what a, what a strange question. What do you mean where I am? I am, I am everywhere. Now. <laughs> I'm virtual. Yeah. Uh, and um, I mean, it, it's not like it's new. It, some of these companies have been around for years and that's what, you know, they, 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 and, but it's just not, it's, it, it's happening now. Now it's being right. opened. So students are going to have to realize that uh, you may never go to the office, ever. Yeah. You may feel like this and you go to start working. Uh, I, I mean, would you get paid the same amount of money? Uh, that's always a question, right? Because if you're in New York and you have to maintain office space and then you got to pay the, the, the staff, mm -hmm. okay? But now there's no more office space. You're all over the place. Are you going to pay the same amount? Well, well Facebook mentioned today, that they are cutting, if you end up working from home long-term and they allow it, don't expect your San Francisco salary to be the same as Here we go. everywhere else. So it, it, companies see it, banks have been focusing on it for, I don't know, probably five, 10 years now, where you'll see all these big New York City banks that have the big office in Manhattan. And then all of a sudden you're moving offices to New Jersey, which is slightly cheaper, but not really. And now here in Dallas, right, I see banks just flooding in, everyone's bringing their risk departments here because it's so much cheaper for, you know, real estate and employees and everything. It's just a, a good move in general, I think, to reduce costs. You know, you mentioned that, uh, you mentioned uh, the move to other areas. I have a, a few student, students that graduated and uh, in the risk management and they went to Florida. And they're saying, well, we're hiring. I don't know about New York, but we're hiring. Uh, and it's a, it's, a big, it's a big bank. So, uh, Rise at such a big presence down in Florida, but they don't have to have a an office, you know, with a retail sign out. It could be a huge building, and that's what they do their risk management from. They don't, they don't really need to be in New York in the streets to conduct business. So, right. it, I think a lot of students miss that too, because when I was going through school, I thought right finance hubs are going to be uh, New York City, Chicago, and maybe like San Francisco area, maybe like down by BlackRock and all that. And now that I work in the quant side, I start realizing there's all these big regional banks. And then the credit card business is actually out of North Carolina. So I'm like, well, I could have applied to jobs there, but I never thought to apply there. Yeah. And then yeah, Alabama, Florida, Texas, Utah, California, like everyone's got a big regional bank somewhere. And there's all these jobs available a lot of times, but of course everyone's focused on, you know, the Goldman Sachs in New York City and the JP Morgans in Gold City and City and all that. And I think a lot of times if you broaden your horizons, you get a better compensation to cost of living ratio. And so you end up making essentially more, you have more savings that you can use for saving or fun activities or whatever. 
during our, we have a weekly de a student um, development course, professional development, and we invite some of our alumni. And, uh, and uh, what they tell the student, in fact, you know, one was, like I said, in Florida, another one was in Boston, another one was in Pittsburgh, uh, one in New York, obviously. And they're saying, you know, um, you know, if you don't necessarily go to New York because everyone else is, wants to go to New York. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so you're competing with all these people. And frankly, yeah, you may get paid less money. Uh, of course, there is a certain amount of prestige, right? If you work in New yeah. York, but I don't know if that, that prestige is going to continue. Uh, going forward, well, because the idea of this, the spot, uh, you know, you're, you're in Pittsburgh, you New York, oh, okay, so this is great. Uh, well, guess what? I'm, I'm in Miami and in San Francisco, and so maybe that's also going to change that perception. Um, I, I think it's starting to, and I can see it continuing, especially for quantitative finance, because the people that are left now in New York are really the investment bankers. So it's like you have some client that's, I don't know, this massive international company. I would like to show them my amazing, you know, high rise office that looks over Manhattan. And look, we're so wealthy and we're so intelligent. We can help you fix this. So I think they keeping a lot of the client facing, but quantitative finance, it's like, you need a statistical model. My job is <laughs> like not exciting for the public, right? You're sitting down coding out programs yeah. and write math. And so I think a lot of them are starting to move decentralized in general and even like wall street itself is dead so i worked on wall street for a while it's just dead every bank's moved to midtown and of course midtown's that flashy exciting hip area to be but again most of those jobs are going to be i think client facing a lot of the rigorous trading for example and all that's going to be moved away more closely to servers and not necessarily towards clients and let's, let's not forget, I mean, uh, in 2008, I don't want to get into a discussion about blockchain, but in 2008, you know, blockchains came to be. Believe it or not, there's a lot of things going on with blockchain today, especially with what's happening in the economy. And, uh, you know, the banks need to, they need to get on board with this new type of thinking as well, because they, you know, it's going to be your cryptocurrency. It's not just Bitcoin. It's cryptocurrency. It's all these topics that are coming up to, and I wouldn't say it's threatening yet the, the banking industry, but um, I don't know if 20 years from now we're still working at big banks, right? Because uh, their model doesn't, didn't perform well in 2008. Let's see what's going to happen this time around. I know the retail sector is gone. So um, things are going to happen that might change the paradigm again all these graduates right they're coming in and i know sometimes i still see applications you know i want to i want to do quantitative finance because i want to work for goldman sachs in new york city in a hedge fund right i i i you know some of my industry advisory council members are uh one of them actually worked for a hedge fund and he said it's not what it used to be no and they're taking a big hit so you need to reposition yourself and so I could imagine as a student, all the things, not only you have to worry about which program, right? but then you got to worry about this, what's going on today, now, right. later. And then on top of that, you have a third layer of, of all these, these changes that are occurring uh, digitally, you know, virtually. Um, I mean, some of the people that I'm talking to are graduated and they are, they are in um, those startups. Some of them uh, graduated from, from the university with a degree in uh, biochemical engineering. I said, what are you doing with blockchain? Yeah. Coding, right? <laughs> you, weren't, you weren't even trained for that. Yeah. So it, I think the worst part too is from a student perspective, it's so hard to see the industry. And I think a lot of students, like even myself, when I was coming up, I mean, you see a lot of the movies and you're like, I know it's not going to be as crazy and glamorous as like Wolf on Wall Street and all that but you still have that idea in the back of your head that's still how the industry is functioning. And then you have me stepping out there telling people like, this is, this is a lie. I mean, this is like the eighties and the nineties guys. It's we're 2020. It's so much different. Yeah. And yet students are still hooked on that. I, that idea that you as an individual can be a trader and you don't need a team of people around you. You don't need management. You don't need computer scientists to optimize and servers and everything like block blockchain, for example, right? You need, 
infrastructure and hardware, you can't just have the one guy that thinks like, I'm going to create trades off of it. Mm -hmm. And so, and you still have people attack you. Like the, I won't say which group of students it is, but there's an educational branch that is vastly upset when I say it and they attack you that like, no, there's people out there making millions of dollars every day because this is how Wall Street works. And I'm like, it's done. <laughs> it's a different <laughs> industry now. It's a whole, whole new paradigm. So yeah, 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 yeah. Well, hopefully that conversation was interesting for, for the students so they get a little bit of perspective. I always tell them, you know, if you're going to apply for a program, I mean, the website is, 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 a, is a 10%, 15% of your decision. I mean, what you have to do is you have to do your homework. You yeah. have to, and especially today, you really need to think what you want, what you want to do when you grow up, what you're going to be studying, where you're going to do it, with whom. Uh, and it's tough because, you know, sometimes they don't have much time. And I could see when they ask me the question, they say, well, you know, this, 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 this important school got in touch with me. I'm looking. I said, How, what does that mean exactly? Yeah. Right? Um, I mean, they may have this great name, but you're not going to be, you're not going to be having a degree from that university. You're going to have a degree from a program within the university. And we mentioned in the past some of the university picking backing their MBA program, um, uh, and uh, they said, "No, but they have a great they have a great YouTube channel." I said, "Well, <laughs> take very, look carefully, and you'll see that the YouTube channel is for the program, not the program, but for the master's program, right?" So they, so, yeah. so you, you get this feeling that okay, so so this is it. I said, "No, you, you, you know, it's like a." Uh, parents with many children, right? You right. may end up with a nasty one, right? And then these are great parents. So you got to make sure that you understand. And it's so tough for the student to make a decision so quickly. And, and it's not, and it's, it's expensive. And not only that, it's expensive in terms of their time. And right. I, like we talked about before, once they're in it, you, you can't just say, you know what? It's yeah, I'm out. I, I, you know what? Forget I don't, I, I'm not buying anymore. I want to go home. I want to try something else. You can't. Right. And I think the hardest part too is when you ask students. So one of the things I like to encourage students to do is before you accept an offer or apply is try to find students from that program. So I graduated, you know, from these different universities, contact them, ask them how they liked the program, which is one question. But the real question is, is asking them what they do. And then try to see if you like what they do, because I found that students that go to poor programs that might not necessarily be what you thought they were, that student's goals aligned with that university. So even though they didn't get the degree that was listed, they're happy because that was a perfect fit for them. But I think a lot of the students, it's like you have some idea in your mind that you think you're going to be doing as a job at the end. And then you get the degree and you find out it's, it's vastly different. The industry is different. The program is different. And so I think the best way to do it is reach out to those alumni and say like, hey, what are, what are you doing every day? And what does your job entail? And then start thinking like, is that interesting to me? If it is, like I would go with that program regardless of right of the name brand or the online rankings, which don't mean too much. Try to find people who have taken similar paths and then try to follow that sure. similar route. I mean, very few students actually ask me to talk. Only, I think only one or two ask me you know, to put them in touch with an existing student to figure out what's going on. But I do tell all of them, I say, look at exactly what our graduates are doing today. And you could do that very easily. Check it out because that's the proof. This is, that's what they did. And more likely than not, I mean, they're not, you know, working in Detroit, you know, building cars. They're doing something, you know, data oriented or risk management. Some of them are doing hedge funds, but, but, Look at it and really, because at the end of the day, that's what you want to, if, if any of those jobs make any sense to you, and especially if you look what they're doing, not right out, right out of the graduating, maybe two, three, some 10 years later, look what they're doing today. That should give you a feel for, for what you want to do. But um, more often than not, I'm not so sure if students actually, you know, they, 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 they don't. <laughs> it's like when you're buying a car, right? Um, you know, you want to get the Mercedes, you want to get the BMW. Well, you know, there's lots of cars with got just as much leather. They're just as fast. They may not have the name recognition. And right. you can save yourself lots of money and it still takes you to the same place. Exactly. And I, 
I think part of that is, I don't know why it's so hard. Like for me, even it was hard for me, I thought I'm not going to ask these students. They don't know. But yet a lot of them, like you mentioned, right, they start that first year or two. They find out maybe they don't like that route. They change careers. They have a new successful career they enjoy. It's so much more helpful as a student to realize like this guy's already made the mistake for you. Just follow his path and like help he'll, he'll tell you what you need to know and give you the information, then you can Correct. make your decision on and it. So. More often than not, they're very uh, you know, they they they, they want to help other students. They want to let them know, listen, this is what I picked, this is what happened, this is what I like, this is what I didn't like. Um, but that's a big job in itself. So you know. Yeah. Any final thoughts as to what the future holds and uh, <laughs> Well, we could spend like two hours talking about this. <laughs> it's an interesting future. I think the big thing for students to focus on, again, is opportunity cost, right? Making sure you're using your time well yeah. in general in life. And then realizing, like you mentioned, right, we're kind of in this weird shocked period. So it's like, I don't know. You don't know. Like, no one knows. Are we going to go online? Are we staying in campuses? Is working all going to be moved to working from home? Where's your location? what industries are kind of going to be situating because we do see some industries kind of shaking out the weaker players. Mm -hmm. And so I think it's definitely an uncertain time, but my advice would just be to like set the goal and just keep working towards it regardless of the, the environment around you. Great. Well, on these uh, parting words, let's uh, part ways and uh, let's, uh, re let's re uh, reconnect uh, after whenever that is. <laughs> to see what happens at the end of the tunnel, probably the end of the year, to see which university is online, which one did it, which one didn't, and how it, uh, everything shaped up. So, uh, Dimitri, thank you very much. Thank you for having me. Thank you.